another one of those kind of churches. I was about to get up and start doing somersaults because I was like, that is what I never hear. And so I want to challenge every one of you that are part of this church at the beginning to be thankful for the church that you're in. I am telling you, I do over 60 conferences a year for the last almost 10 years nonstop. And I can count on one hand the churches that are so Christ-centered as I saw today. And so this is not the common. So if you have any complaints or I don't like the, the coffee's not strong enough or anything like that, or anything like that, I think it's time to repent of that. Yeah. Because I have been kicked out of places. I have, it's just a lot of people are not ready to hear the truth of the glory of Christ. They just want something to be angry about. And they have no eschatological hope. They're looking for a utopia in this age, and it's not going to come. But what is beautiful in this age is the glorious church of Jesus Christ, his bride, his body. And that is what we strive for, for a pure, glorifying God body of believers in this wicked age. Well, for those of you who were not here this weekend... There is something called purgatory. No, uh, (laughs) just kidding. I've been around the Latin America too long. Or I could do it the American way. There's something called sow your seed of money to me and you'll be forgiven. I just want to give you a quick recap of what we did. There's no way I can do justice to it. I don't know how many hours we were together this weekend, but in like a few minutes, I don't know how you could do that. So I'm just going to give you a quick recap, but I do believe that everything that was taught this weekend will be available online. So please watch that. Even my, yes, all the, I think about 600 and something slides that I shared this weekend, they'll all be there in PDF form for for you. And um, also, I just want you all to make sure that that is not my wife. There was a few people confused on that. If that were to be my wife, you would say, boy, you went young. That is, that is my daughter. <laughs> She's my second daughter. I even have another daughter who's older. We have six children, by God's grace. Um, so really quickly, I started out for the conference on the first talk on the theology of manhood and womanhood. And that went exactly according to the sermon you heard today. The Bible doesn't start talking about the fall. It talks about God's very good creation, and we want to follow the same order of teaching that the Bible does. And I talked about what is a lot of the things that are behind the sexual revolution. Even the French Revolution had something to do with that. Uh, Marxism had a lot to do with that. And then the free love in the 1960s and 90s that was used to try to teach that the only way to take women out of the oppression of monogamy and childhood from an old cavehood society was to have uh, libertinaje, um, lawlessness in sexuality. And 21st century, uh, we go into this extended, not only is... um, And then we looked at how Jeremiah warns us about identifying how we feel on the inside. So when say, I identify, I self-identify as something else, well, the heart is deceitful above all things and def- desperately see- sick. Who can understand it? How could that be the standard by how we identify ourselves? And for although they knew God, Paul says in Romans, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Then I taught the five points that we must understand before dealing with homosexuality and gender ideology. These were the quick five points. If we don't understand the function and purpose in the original design, we have no right or no, and no platform to deal with today's sexual perversity. You can't say this is wrong unless you're saying it's wrong because it's not this. Okay. Number two, in God's design, distinction and function establishes complementarianism, not inequality. In the, in the Trinity himself, our triune guard, God, with respect to creation and redemption, and maybe even beyond that, there greater means better only in a humanistic system. 
but not in a theological system. And also, the Holy Spirit does not give testimony about himself here. He does not testify. But who does the Holy Spirit point to? Christ. And who sent the Holy Spirit? The Father. Who asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit? The Son. You see, there's different complementary roles for God's glory. And so since we're made in God's image, our complementary roles as men and women doesn't make anyone more important than the other or better than the other. We're not humanists, but it is for God's glory. This is the way he decreed that he will be glorified by his image bearers in complementary ways. Also, this is a spiritual battle to restore the wicked heart of man. It is not so much political, social, or cultural. I went with the uh, SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, just um, with Barry Wilmore to Puerto Rico the end of last year. And the complaint they set us down, because I have recorded this conversation on a video blog, a traveling blog which we started, and their biggest complaint was, we had a group of churches get a conservative right-wing person to come talk to our youth in, in Puerto Rico against gender ideology and all this. But it was a whole sham. Why? Because at the end, the lady said, so let's just thank Mother Nature or whoever you consider God. Because they, they, we sometimes get too political on it. And then what do we lose? The God's glory side, the covenant in Christ, the new kingdom. And they were surprised how it ended. And so they brought us up and they said, we want to hear something more biblical. And then also, number four, this is the worldview issue. It has to do, what does it mean to be a human? You know, in today's world, people are denying what it means to be a human, that we're evolved animals. Uh, and number five, biblical manhood and womanhood are to be taught. We are not naturalists. We are not psychologists, okay? We are not under this idea that you and I are evolved animals and our outward behavior has to be um, manipulated by outward stimuli, uh, and so, and also, so if, if a child and his DNA says you need to be like a girl, even though you're a boy, well, that just had something to do with his DNA and his environment. You can't change that. Just let him be. That's who he is. He's being authentic or she's being authentic. No, we teach biblical manhood. We teach biblical womanhood. I was so grateful for what your pastor, pastor elder said today about being careful with the cultural stereotypes of biblical manhood and womanhood, that they're not always biblical. Um, because I used to get picked on a lot as a youth because I didn't like sports. I'm a nerd. You may see this great looking athletic guy right in front of you now and never believe it. But I was the nerd. I was the one who was bullied. I was the one who was hit a lot and beat up. I was the one who went to poetry class. I love poetry till now. Now, I'm not saying I was being effeminate, but imagine if I would have been raised in this generation. I don't like sports. I'm not good at them. I, I trip over my own feet. I'm very clumsy. I love poetry. I'm a little sensitive sometimes. They would have said, I think you're actually a girl in a guy's body. Maybe they would have confused me about that. And so it was very good to hear that. Actually, we have two books coming out in English and Spanish at the same time in two weeks for children, Why God Made Me a Boy and Why God Made Me a Girl, teaching that, going against gender ideology. And this is for children that I co-wrote with my oldest daughter, who's not here. So anyways, and then that was that talk. And then we talked about raising children for a present and future biblical understanding of sex and covenant. We first, I first mentioned three common parenting mistakes and what they reveal about our hearts as moms and dads. These parenting mistakes can get in the way of us helping our children. And then eight points on sexuality and covenant. The three common errors, which there are a lot more. I was actually just being open with you. These are the par parenting problems I have had. Okay, so you could have less or more. You have to look like a perfect family, especially in church. That's a common error. Is all of a sudden, if you have a child struggling with sin, what's the first thing you're going to worry about? What is Corey going to think of us now? We're going to look like we failed as a family. And your child's heart's right there. And their eternity in front of the Lord is right there. And that's not what you're thinking about. That's not what you're fighting for. You're fighting for your image. And that's very sad. We use children as little trophies sometimes. And they are not yours. Well, 
Today they say they're not yours, they belong to the state. No, they are ours, <laughs> but they are not yours when it comes to God. They are created in God's image and likeness. And we are mayordomos, stewards of them. Blaming our parents for every bad attitude, weakness of ours, or lack of opportunity regarding parenting and marriage. Uh, the first few years I spent in my marriage doing this, and I've seen other people do it that I've counseled a lot too throughout the years. Oh, it's she's being just like her, my mother-in-law. The poor mother-in-laws of this world, they're brought in as the kicking point in many arguments in marriages. Uh, or father-in-law, you're just like your father. Well, no, the buck stops here. I am a sinner. I need to be dealt with, and we need to work as a team in our marriage. And then number three, depending on our own convictions and control instead of God's grace in Christ. You heard about the purity movement that was mentioned that came through Mexico. It's going through Mexico right now. We're always about 20 years behind you all down there. There's some kind of something buffering happens when you go through the border. Right now, they're going through the purity movement and the homeschooling movement. And I have nothing to say good or bad for homeschooling. I think it's great. I teach at these homeschooling conferences in Mexico. Uh, over a thousand, we'll have over a thousand students at a time in different parts. But then I'll hear another speaker get up and he'll just make, if you raise them this way, keep them out of the schools. If you get these points, you have a promise from God. They will never depart from him. They will walk with him. And so I have challenged them to their face and to the point now they won't even invite me back. No, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot say if I do these points, we're going to make my children in the kingdom of God. You, you are spitting on Jesus and his cross when you do that. It is by his grace alone. So then we spoke on the eight points on sexuality and covenant. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. This is just the recap. Be open and prepared to teach on this topic. Uh, my wife once said, my parents never talked about sexuality. My wife's from Mexico. She's from a little pueblo called Sombrerete, right outside of Zacatecas near Durango. And, she's, and she has a family of 12 children. And old school Mexico, brother. And her parents never talked about the subject. And she goes, my parents never talked about it. And I said, yes, but guess what? We live in a different day and they should have talked to you about it. But in the day we have, by the time your child is two or three years old, we have people that you've seen on the news and you've seen on TV that they will teach your children. They are, you're going to decide, am I going to teach my children on this or are they? So if you say, I'm not doing it, you're opening up the door for all this sexual perversion for them to take over and teach your children. Number two, teach first le the legitimacy and covenant aspect of sexual relations. You just heard that in the sermon, didn't you? Yes, first focus on that. So I was thinking, wow, this whole conference, everything just kind of worked together. And I never met in person, your uh, Corey, before this. I only uh, did it through uh, Zoom, and we did not come to an agreement on doing that. Teach the covenantal aspect with, relate, with respect to Christ and his church as far as the marriage goes. That, man, you represent Christ. Woman, you represent the church. So men, love your wives. Well, she's always nagging at me. Yeah, well, you know what? Think about how you as the church have been with your, uh, with Christ. Have we been nagging at him? We've done much more. We've been unfaithful. We've been capricious. We've been indifferent. And his covenant stands. So I cannot compare any complaint I would have with what Christ has put up with his church, his bride. So I just need to love her for the glory of God. And you say, well, I need her to be more this way. Well, you know what? God never gave you another sinner to fulfill your needs. My needs are fulfilled in Christ. And then when husband and wife are seeking after Christ and are bathing their hearts in his glory, his holiness, and uh, revealed in creation, which is a one way of calling glory and the, which way we were designed to find greatest satisfaction in that. When you both are, you look at through your marriage through covenant understanding eyes, and then that's going to overflow and you're going to find joy in your marriage. But you can't go directly to someone of the opposite sex in marriage and say, I'm going to find my joy in you. That's a leaky sinner. Now, why do I call them leaky? Because they are this vase that's cracked and they can't hold water. But Christ is the fount of living water. He will give, he will quench that thirst, not another sinner. And then he will bring joy to your marriage. 
So, uh, teach the purpose of sexual relations and the covenant aspect and purpose uh, with respect to your future spouse. And I uh, so teach my children. By the age you have now, it's most likely, if, you know, if the Lord's will that you be married, your future spouse is living right now. You just don't know it. But this is the person God has put aside for you from all eternity past. And so guess what? There, you're not in this really time of being single, to be honest with you. You need to be praying for that person, honoring and respecting that person. Pray for their salvation. Pray for their walk with Christ. I don't know this person's name, but I'm praying for them. And, but your heavenly father has always existed. Honor him before all. And then teach its purpose with respect to their future children. Uh, when temptation comes, young ladies and men in here, when temptation comes, think about this. If you were raised in a home with mom and dad, don't you want to do all this in your power to give that to your future children too? Can't you love them already now? When I have children, I'm going to love them. Now you can start loving them right now. And, and so, so think about that. Now, for those of you who did not grow up with a home with mom and dad who loved the Lord, well, don't you want better for your children, your future children? So there's always something to say, you know, if you already say God is... So what is everything I've said so far based on? The assumption, which is a true assumption, that God is sovereign. God's not saying, ooh, I wonder if she's going to get married. Ooh, who's this guy? I guess he's a good mate. No, it's all God is sovereign. And when you understand God's sovereignty, you can trust in him. And you can think in covenant aspects and pray for whoever comes in the future. Number six, teach them about the multifaceted damage caused by his misuse. Notice how I waited till point number six now to speak against sexual immorality. Just like God waited until he spoke of his wonderful and beautiful creation until before he told us about the fall. Then teach the grace of God in Christ to forgive and restore. We do not want to raise a bunch of little hypocrites. Your children, and I know some of us, this may be hard to hear. Your, when I was in the Navy, I was in a submarine, and they would tell us about these escape hatches, and what you, you have to go ho, 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 if you have to go out when you're underneath water because of the expansion of what's going to happen in your lungs, and you can blow them. You have to go ho, 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 or else your lungs will grow, they will expand and probably kill you right there. But then they say, but if you're ever in that circumstance, you're probably going to die anyway. <laughs> we say, well, why is it there? And they told us, for mommies in Congress. That's what they used to tell us, for mommies in Congress. We have to put that there. And so if there's anybody here, you know, it's hard to hear this about your children. Well, it's a good thing to take this in. Your children, especially if they're teenagers, are going to struggle with sexual sin. I'm not going to say they're going to lose virginity. I'm talking about this, what Jesus said, that if you look on a woman with lust, you've already adulterated with her in your heart. They're going to struggle then. And so... If we only talk to them about being pure, being pure, being pure, we're giving, we're just, we're not talking about anything about how God's going to restore them and how they can repent when they're even struggling in their own heart with sexual sin. Number eight, teach them that finally our only sexual purity and our only righteousness is that of Christ. They're not storing up something. Was, you know, I, I noticed that maybe I was not teaching it totally right when my oldest daughter told me two years ago, Dad... I have made this agreement with God. I will not kiss a man until it's our wedding day. And I said, well, I, I really like that. That's great. But the way you said it worried me. And she's like, what? I thought my dad would love to hear that. I said, but the way you said it, because on that wedding day, when you put on a white dress, don't say it's because I've never even kissed a guy. That white dress represents purity, right? As a bride. I said, your only true purity will be that, the righteousness of Christ, not your own. Be careful. And it's so hard. My wife and I came to know the Lord out of the world. I mean, we know what it means to be a terrible sinner on the outside and the inside. The problem always we've had in church history is the second generation. The second generation, they never experienced that expressing the sin in the outside world. So sometimes they think they don't have it on the inside. 
And as they get these young children to understand the, the wickedness of their own heart, even if they never went out and were getting drunk, partying, fornication, and they may think that somehow that they're more holy when that's just really an outward expression of the evil in their own hearts. And so I'm going to keep my children from the world. Well, guess what? You're going to have to tear their heart out because the world's right in there. They need the gospel. And so let's make sure we don't raise them thinking that, well, I never went out and got drunk. I was a virgin, so my parents really needed Christ. I just kind of needed them as I get mad every now and then. That they understand the depravity of their own heart and their need for Jesus, that they would never trust in their own righteousness. Then the next talk was about discipling those with same-sex attraction and gender dysphoria. And again, this was hit on in the sermon today over and over again. I was really celebrating. Um, number one step, the gospel, the gospel, and then the gospel. This is not theoretical. This is not saying, yeah, Joe, if you've ever dealt with any of them, you wouldn't be able to do this. Well, for years, I've been discipling people with this. And right now, I'm discipling two families and one young man. And these three cases, in all three, which is not always this way, but in all three cases I have in front of me right now, the young, the man was raped when he was a boy by another man. And so we can see how that distorts and how that perverts and how that messes up. And with this young man now, we're texting throughout the week. You know what we, he and I are really focusing on? How to not be a homosexual. No. Five ways to stop looking at men that way. No. You know what? I'm really hitting with him and reading with him and talking to him and, and preaching to him about the glory of God and Christ and God's holiness. Because you know why? I have my own struggles with sin. And those of you who've been walking for Christ with a while, haven't you started noticing that most change in your heart happens the more that you contemplate God's holiness? The more that it stops being the God of, yeah, this uh, abstract thing that we learn about in Sunday school, but you start looking into the face of Christ, exegeted from scripture, you contemplate it, and you start seeing more and more the glory of God. By the way, that's 2 Corinthians 4, 6. I'm not making it up. And, uh, and then you start looking at yourself, God's holiness yourself, and say, okay, I need to stop playing this little game of little secret sins, secret attitudes that I'm putting up with. I'm really starting to understand more what God's glory and his holiness is. So what am I, uh, I'm talking to them, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Point number one goes all the way down to point number 10. You always hit the gospel no matter how point you're on. You say, what if he's, he becomes saved? You still preach the gospel. I need to remind myself of the gospel every day. Number two, the goal is Christ, that this person be made conform to the image of Christ, not heterosexuality. I don't have to talk much about that point because you just heard it in the sermon again yourself. There is no such thing as a gay Christian because today the first thing, what are they going to do if they're struggling with this inside and they're trying to find a way to justify it? How can I live this way? And then what is, you just put in gay Christian in Google or in YouTube, you're going to get hundreds of videos and articles that are going to tell them you can be a gay Christian. It's okay. And so I really discussed uh, for you and me to be a Christian, it, it, what, what cost our Lord of glory is for him to be accursed. Galatians 3. Are you really going to say, thank you for being accursed for me, O holy, holy, thrice holy God? Thank you for being cursed for me, but now you still don't get all of me. You have to share Christ. And whatever name is on our foreheads you see in Revelation, you're going to have to share that with a sin, gay. You're going to have to be in fellowship with it over my life. I'm not, I'm not going to play with my Savior that way. Number uh, four, this temptation is common. Uh, many people I speak to with this problem, with this sin, they say, Joe, you've been married 23 years. You have six children. You are what heterosexuality looks like. You could never understand me. I'm this artist tendency usually. I'm not saying all, but almost all of them tell me. I'm, this, this, I'm very artistic, and I look at things different than other people, and someone like you could never understand what it's like. And the Bible says, nope, there is no temptation that is not common to man. So don't try and make yourself think that you're out in some island that, is, uh, that can't be reached, that you're so special. And that's a little narcissistic also, but that's just another problem with our society today. Number four, number five, discipleship is based on scripture, not modern psychology. Modern psychology assumes uh, evolutionary anthropology that you and I are evolved apes or ape-like creatures, that we come from accidents. 
So just as you train a dog not to use the bathroom in the house, you train human behavior. But the gospel reaches the heart. How can you mix two things that are totally opposite, especially in their foundation? Number six, the redeemed grow in finding satisfaction with Christ. When somebody is in Christ, it's not automatically like in the movies. Oh, everything's great. I love Christ. No, we walk in Christ, with Christ, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, learning how to find satisfaction in Christ. And I talked about the, the Christian disciplines. Number seven, teach them how to preach the word to themselves. And I use Psalm 62 as an example, and I don't know how much of that I'll get into. Number eight, teach them to only trust in Christ, not in their progress. You know, the New Testament especially warns about thinking that you're firm. Be careful that you don't fall. Don't get to a point, oh, 10 years ago, I used to struggle with that. I'm good now. I can handle it. Know that you're starting to trust in your own resolve instead of the grace of God in Christ. Um, number nine, patiently teach them biblical manhood and womanhood. That was mo mostly from the first, the theology that we talked about in the first one. Ten, ultimately, our only righteousness is Christ's righteousness. That's the last point in the first talk as well, or the second talk. Notice how we keep going back to that. Okay, then we got into some apologetics. We looked at the LGBTQ and gender ideology movements, how they're based on naturalism, this idea that came from the Greeks, uh, that after the Renaissance and the ad fontes or the back to the sources of humanism from the Renaissance, people started going back in the Greek writings and rediscovered in the West this naturalistic idea that the Greeks had. Uh, this was stalled by the Protestant Reformation for about 150 years, and then it came back and started squashing the Reformation. And that's when all of a sudden we got liberal theology coming out. Um, this naturalistic idea believes that we are only animals, so whatever animals do, we can do. If I can find an animal that can have some kind of uh, homosexual uh, behavior, then yes, humans, we're just animals as well. And then I said, well, let's, let's think about that. The rooster, he's an animal. What does he do to the hen, especially when you put a new one in his pen? He's go if you're going to speak in anthropological terms, he rapes her. So are we going to start saying that men should be able to rape women because we're just animals just like the rooster? You see that you're going to quickly find out that's not a standard you want for humankind. And then the born gay movement. We looked at the uh, failed studies, genetic studies, anatomical studies from the 90s up until now and how each one of them has come out inconclusive to date 2022. We have no experiment that shows that someone is born gay. So we saw plan B of this movement, and it is to say, well, then gender and sex are two different things. You may have been born with an XXXY chromosome, being uh, male or female, but gender, uh, your function, how you are identified uh, in those distinctions is only a social construct. They're not the same thing, and that's the gender ideology now being pushed. Okay, well, if I can't prove you're born gay in the empirical sense, then I'm going to relativize what it means to be a boy and a girl and push this idea into the mind of the world. And I showed you some of the curriculum being used to teach children this. Maybe your mom and dad said uh, you're a boy when you're born, but guess what? You, may, you don't have to identify that way, and it uh, provokes them to identify in different ways. Um, and then we looked at a dialogue with a gay Christian uh, this is uh, me answering the gay Christian movement. This one was the most technical, and this one was the one that was almost two hours long to get through it, and there's so much more I could have said. Um, but because this movement is growing, this is the one I have a burden for to confront the mo uh, most directly right now because they are trying to use the word of God, the pure holy word of God to promote sin. And that is what should hurt every Christian and bother every Christian to the most inner part of your core. Okay. And then I talked about the Bible teaches you should not lie with male as with a woman. It's an abomination. And then I showed you the arguments against using Leviticus because it's in the law and we're not under the law supposedly. Uh, and then I show, we walked through those arguments for a very long time. And then we looked at Romans that for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. I think the Bible's 
pretty clear that God is not blessing that. Well, they'll say, but Paul was speaking against a pagan form of sexuality based on idolatry and lust, not love between two people of the same sex. What they've done is said, okay, you know, even though God is love, what we're going to do is relativize that word love and everybody's, that love just means um, being nice to somebody. What, the problem is, is that God is not made up of compartments. This compartment is love. This compartment is wrath. This compartment is holy. No, God is holy. God is just. God is love. God is truth. So if you have a, a, a version of love that denies truth, the problem is not in God. The problem is in you. You are trying to pit God's attributes against each other. In other words, if you say it is homosexuality just out of love, and I'm also a Christian, and that you, what you're trying to say is God is bipolar, okay? And that is, that is heretical, not just, that is, that is blaspheme. And just be careful what you say about God, because when you say something is truth or love, you're speaking of God himself. Anything outside of God is not love and is not truth, Okay? And then I showed you, I gave you this long argument, what Paul is really saying. Paul is saying that you and I are not dualists. We're not secular and sacred. We are sacred in all. And everything you do is for the glory of God. You cannot d divide those two. You can't say, I'm going to go out fighting and sinning on Friday. And as long as I go to my confession before mass, I'll be okay. And it's okay. God just is okay with this over and over again. Every part of my life is theological, it's for God's glory. Uh, Paul said that the natural vertical part of man is to be, and he's a worshiper, so he is to have gratitude and glorify his creator God. But because of our sin, we're suppressing the, uh, the knowledge of God, how God reveals himself with our own unrighteousness continuously, but you're still a worshiper. So if you're saying, if God made you a worshiper, but you're denying that there's a God with your sin, well, you're going to have to worship something. So what's everything outside of God? Nature or his creation, because God's not part of his creation. We're not pantheists. So... People come, become thankful to and glorify the creation itself. And Paul says that's idolatry. And Paul here is defining the term paganism, what we use today. That's paganism. And your vertical paganism is going to affect your horizontal life because they're not separated. Again, we're not Gnostics. We're not dualists. Let's separate the two. So if you're doing paganism on a vertical sense with God, paganism is going to affect your horizontal life as well. So Paul says in your horizontal life, what's natural is one man with one woman in a marriage covenant, but then God finally turns you over to your unbridled lust because of your vertical problem, and then women and men fall into homosexuality. So in other words, Paul is saying, if you, you want to see the first and biggest sign of a culture that has gone paganistic is more homosexuality and open homose homosexuality. What does that tell you about the United States of America? What does that tell you? God already warned us. We have become pagan. Even if they say at the Oscars, well, God called me to do this. I just heard recently God is calling me to do this and that. They used to name God a lot in this culture, but it's not the God of the Bible. Okay? We are warned that God haters this, the, as it grows in the society, God starts lifting up his restraining hand and they start going into all of this, okay? So we are seeing the uh, effects of that. And this gay Christian movement says, no, the only part bad with this, uh, the shameless acts is if you do homosexuality and lust instead of love. And God's, and, but you, to say that, you have to ignore the two sides of the argument and ignore everything above. Uh, and they say, these are the shameless acts, but Paul's saying, no, these are the shameless acts. Uh, Paul saying, no, these are the shameless acts. The, that's what I would like to teach you or leave with you here. A lot of false teaching, people use the Bible to do false teaching. You say, how can someone use God's holy word to teach falsehood? Because God's word has these building of arguments. And if you put all the arguments together then the, you see the truth. That's why God says in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, do not adulterate the word of God. But, but if you see arguments with the Bible, 
And this is some, okay, now I'm acting like your students in seminary. Sorry about that. But if you see arguments in the Bible that are used to teach heresy, put them out here. Put them all out and notice, are they ignoring parts of the argument to come up with that heresy? And I just showed you they're ignoring at least two parts to come up with that. Bat, that. So Paul's point is not that homosexuality is wrong if it is the result of pagan idolatry and lust. That's the argument being given by this movement but that all homosexuality is a consequence of pagan idolatry and lust. Just as paganism is exchanging the God who created nature for a God of human imagination, so the consequences, the consequences are an exchange of God's natural order for one against nature. I can definitely see I'm not going to get to Psalm 62, so I'm going to have to owe you that one. Okay, Someday I love preaching Psalm 62, the whole psalm. I love it. Every time I do, I've preached it in Spanish maybe over 30 times now. It's on YouTube over 30 times. I love preaching it because every time I do, God keeps confronting me with things in my own life. He's always, always talking to me through that psalm. But anyways, that's how, if you want to learn how to teach the, preach to yourself, go through Psalm 62. It'll teach you very well. Well, the, and then here's, I'm going to nerd out on you a little bit. And I hope we're still up for it because we're at the end. This is, was the most technical part yesterday, so I thought it would be worth going into again and just to give you more time to process it after you heard it, okay? This gay Christian movement, they have apologists, full-time apologists, making a lot of money off the books they're writing, speaking engagements. They're setting the time aside to come up with these complex arguments. And we have to bring down every argument that comes against the knowledge of God and submit all of our thoughts to the obedience of Christ, the Bible says. And I'm translating that from Spanish to English, so I don't know how exactly it's said in English. So we need to confront these arguments and show the truth of God. There is a word that is used twice in, twice in the New Testament, and it is different declensions of the word arsenicoites. Okay, Arsenicoites is translated in 1 Timothy 1, 8 in the ESV as men who practice homosexuality. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, it's also in the ESV uh, translated as men who practice homosexuality. But actually, in 1 Corinthians 6, there are two words, malakos and arsenicoites. Malakos is literally means soft. It is when um, two men come together, the man who takes the woman's role. You have an imagination. I don't have to get too more explicit on that, right? Okay, and then arsenicoitai is the man who takes the role of the man when two men come together. All right, and so what people are saying is, see that word homosexuality there in English? That's a new word in English vocabulary. It was just added to the Bible recently. So because of the discrimination of Bible translators who didn't like homosexuality, they added that to the Bible just recently. I've heard that argument used by so many people. But that real word in Greek, no one really knows what it means because it's not in any other document in the, the time of Paul and Jesus in any Greek document. So how can we know what it really means? Are we seeing people's discrimination in the recent centuries that being added into the translations of what was written 2,000 years ago? So does that argument, that sounds, I mean, they, they want to fight. And I'm going to bring the fight right back to them. Because... This is God's eternal word, and it came before you and me, and it will be hereafter. It is pure, and it is for God's glory, and when someone starts messing with that, that's when we do respond in a more direct way, okay? Even more aggressive way sometimes, not physically. They say arsenicoites most likely refers to male temple prostitutes, not two men who love each other. In other words, in 1 Timothy, in 1 Corinthians, Paul, all he's saying really is, hey, you Greco-Roman churches, stop going on Saturdays before the Lord's Day to, the, to, the, to, the, to these Greek uh, priests and priestesses and stop making your donation, your offering to their gods by sleeping with a male prostitute that they didn't have in those days. Paul's not talking about two Christian men who love each other in the church. What does that have to do with prostitution? 
And the reason why it says homosexuality in English is because of the prejudices of Bible translators more recently. Paul never said that. Now, that sounds like a pretty complex argument. But I'm going to tear it apart because the truth has to be shown. God's word is true. Well, Paul is taking that word from the Greek Septuagint. Looks like it. The Greek Septuagint is the translation of the Old Testament or the Tanakh and a few other documents from Hebrew to Greek. This was done in North Africa probably around a couple hundred years before Christ. You know, ever since Alexander the Great, he took the culture and language of the Greek all through the, the Near Eastern, cerca Oriente, uh, Near Eastern literature, and he took that, and now people are writing in Greek instead of other languages. So that's why your New Testament's written in Koine Greek, okay? And so we have a group of people that don't understand the Hebrew of the Old Testament, or what we call the Old Testament today. So they needed a translation into Greek. And when Jesus and the apostles quote the Old Testament and the New Testament, many times it could be proven before beyond a shadow of a doubt, they are quoting the Septuagint, the Greek version, okay? If anybody has a doubt about that, I can handle that. I can show you just in Hebrews 2, 5 through 10 right away. There would be no doubt. Well, there, if you go to the prohibition and Leviticus against homosexual behavior, man lying with man, not against prostitution, you find that word arsenikoites, but it's just in two words. So it became a compound word in Paul's day. So now do you see how, uh, how that is? That word is never used in any document around that time. Yeah, we don't find it used as a compound word. So in other words, if you just split it one centimeter apart, does it, does, is you saying it has a different meaning now? It's just a compound word of two words. And also, we see that in Leviticus, Leviticus 20, 13, the same uh, prohibition against men lying with men. And guess what? There it is. Arsenokoitis, arsenoskoitin. And so it became a compound word in the time of the New Testament. So it is we can know what it means. It's a prohibition against man lying with man. But if Paul would have wanted to say, oh, the prohibition is not against men lying with men who love each other and are Christian, that's no problem. The prohibition is against male cult prostitutes. Well, wouldn't Paul have used the regular term for male cult prostitutes in Greek? Wouldn't he have? Which is kadesim? So if you're going to say, oh, the prohibition is just against male cult prostitutes, then why didn't Paul use the word in the word of God for male cult prostitutes. Why did he use the ones that are restricting any men lying with men? Doesn't matter if you say you love each other or if it's a prostitute. So those are not the words that Paul used that, but how many of us Christians will read Greek or go into the Septuagint so they think they're going to get the majority of you by doing that. Also in the original Hebrew, those are different terms either. In other words, that was the most technical. If you're okay, if you're not, okay. In Hebrew, about 3,500 years ago, you can't say that the prohibition against man lying with another man is just another way to say a male prostitute. I told you, I showed you there's two different total contexts and two different meanings in the original Hebrew. I just showed you in the Greek Septuagint, 2100 years ago, 2200 years ago, a man lying with another man is not just another way to say male prostitute. You can't say that's what Paul really meant. So how can you say in English today that a man lies with a man? Paul's just trying to say a male prostitute. So that's, that is... Um, that is, that is historically wrong. That is linguistically wrong. That means that you have an agenda to reinterpret God's word to add some kind of a sin into it. Then, see, I have five minutes left or four minutes left. Four? Yeah, I knew that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Psalm 62 will not be touched today. But let me go back to this because what I've done is I've only condemned up to this point. And we can't, con I'm not here to condemn Truth brings freedom. It doesn't bring condemnation. Or do you not know that, do you think Paul wrote this, even though not, I don't believe Paul was inspired, but the text is inspired. If he has a question of that, the Bible never says God inspired men. It says he carried them. The text is what's inspired. Do you not, but this text is inspired, but also included it is Paul's intentions, right? He's not like this. Okay. Do you think Paul here was just one to condemn everybody. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Or do you think he's worried? Do you think he has a holy preoccupation for people? 
Paul's not saying this because he wants to talk bad about people. He is worried. This is the bride of Christ. And we want people to think they're part of it when they're not. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, nor the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor the men who practice homosexuality. Those are the two terms, the soft and the malakos. I mean, the malakos and narcissistic, okay, the ones I just showed you. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. The gospel is maybe you were known for doing that, but in the gospel, no longer. You're a new creature. And the problem here in the States is in the 90s, through some seminaries in this state, and I still like Texas, this idea came out of non-lordship Christianity. And it was in this state it came out of. It wasn't this church, though. With this idea, we had a whole generation of pastors being taught in a seminary that you can be a, just a carnal Christian. You can live total sinful lives, but at the end you'll be saved. You'll just get less rewards. And then, by God's grace, God had lifted up a man named John MacArthur who responded to them and, and gave them a, a holy slap. And, and God used John MacArthur to, to stop that, and it stopped. And that seminary today, most of them denies it now. They don't teach it anymore. But then, in the 90s, a lot of our pastors today, when did they go to seminary? In the 90s. So a lot of them stayed with that idea. But the gospel does not just say, you're saved now, so do your best. But if you're not, you'll just be a carnal Christian. You'll be in heaven anyway. No, God does not only save us from the guilt of sin. He saves us also from his power. We just sang that by Augustus Top Lady and the hymns. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You've been cleansed from the stain of sin. You were sanctified. You have been broken from the chains and the power of sin, set apart from it. You were justified. You were legally declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And we have a message to a world who is, needs hope and truth and an eschatological hope that we all have in Christ if you're in him. And I am 15 seconds away, so I shall pray. Okay? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you because your truth brings hope. It brings freedom. It brings a new nature. Oh, Lord, what we spat on and hated and ran from your glory in Christ. Now is our drink and our eat. Now we love what we used to hate. Thank you for translating us to a new kingdom, the kingdom of your glorious son in Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there is somebody in here, whether they agree with the LGBTQ stuff or not, whether they're living it or not, there are some people in here, maybe even some young people who still do not know you. Lord, may you grant them repentance. Lord, may you give them this effectual calling for them to see Christ for who he is and your glory in his face. May they repent and trust in Christ who died and rose again. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you that this church teaches truth. Give this church a burden, I pray, Lord, to not just rejoice that in this building truth is preached, but they would have a burden to take that out to the nations. We don't have it. Please give this church even a more missional burden, Lord. What they have freely received here, may they keep freely giving it out to many other people and other nations that need this truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.